when we did World Race, I made switchback super duper low. It's like yeah, a, it doesn't like, really work on the track very well. <laughs> it barely drives over a piece of paper. I was quite yeah. proud of that. Um, you know, <laughs> it'll hit, it'll bump into a trading card. It lays out. It's nice. Hello, and welcome to the Squared Corner Podcast. I'm your host, JC Squared, where I will be interviewing Hot Wheels guests from beyond and more. <laughs> uh, today's guest I have with me is Hot Wheels designer Eric Cherney. I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. That's good to hear. It's good to hear. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to have you on. I'm, I'm a sincerely, I'm a fan. Uh, you've done a lot for Hot Wheels and diecasts in general. Uh, just some of the stuff you know, muscle tone, power age, uh, this MST, uh, list goes on and on. And I just, I guess let's start at the beginning. Uh, how did you get here? So I got here because I love toys. I love cars. Um, by the time I got to high school, I kind of stashed away all those great toys from the eighties, whether it's GI Joe, hot wheels, transformers, all that good stuff. Um, you know, I was a big fan of GI Joe in particular, but you get to high school, sort of not cool. Got myself into cars at the time, <laughs> got into muscle cars, got into mini trucks, loud car stereo stuff, uh, custom stuff, and decided I was going to be a car designer because it was kind of like playing with toys uh, for, uh, I guess, young adults uh, at the time. <laughs> so from there, it took me to the University of Cincinnati, um, Cincinnati, uh, well-known industrial design school. Um, while you're there, you get, you know, it takes five years to graduate, but you get four and a half years worth of work experience. That co-op program introduced me to Nathan Proach, a uh, longtime mm. Hot Wheels designer. Uh, Nathan brought me out uh, summer 1998 was the first time I worked at Hot Wheels uh, as an intern. Oh, wow. And then uh, went back in January of 99, right after Christmas, finished up my second internship in March. Graduated school uh, in June, and by four or five days after the 4th of July, I was in Los Angeles, and I've been in Southern California ever since. Wow, that's cool. So did you did you know Nathan uh, before? Uh, like, because I think, did he go to University of Cincinnati as well? Nathan was a graduate how... of Cincinnati. Okay. Um. I did not know Nathan personally, though um, a fellow designer, Garrick Zach, who I think is at Hyundai now. Um, he was a car designer, really, really uh, talented uh, guy. He had worked for Nathan. And when he came back, he was like, you know, if you don't get a car design job, you know, the, the car design jobs are super competitive. Yeah. They're almost like a competition to get uh, to get a spot. So when I didn't get one of those spots, Garrick was like, Hey, you should really call Nathan. He's been taking some guys. It's car design. It's Southern California. Um, mm. you know, go out there and have some fun. Um, okay. And I did. And I think, you know, working in, you know, in toys at Hot Wheels, um, really put me where I needed to be and where I belonged. The kind of cars I was interested in, the kind of stuff I was interested in it was probably more in that world than it was in real cars. Like a real oh. low desire to design things like minivans and, uh, you know, at the time, you know, Honda Accords and Camrys and Tauruses were, were kind of like toasters. They weren't really yeah. exciting <laughs> vehicles. Um, yeah. certainly nothing like the Hot Wheels cars <laughs> that I had done. Right. Um, right. And so for me, Hot Wheels was a, a creative outlet that, uh, was, kind of unmatched yeah got it so like um uh i was just thinking like you did you did a honda civic right did did you do that based off of the the actual one first how did that how did that happen sort of uh, so you're talking about that uh, i want to say it's like the 2001 honda civic project yeah yeah the si yeah so one. there was a honda civic si um you know, as a, as a young Hot Wheels designer, I kind of got a lot of the young projects, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, many of the many of the senior guys on staff were like, "Oh, send the kid to go do that tuner project because they wanted to work <laughs> on the cars," right? Um, yeah. <laughs> so, 
So I got involved in that project. That project actually started as David Martis's project. Um, it was in the 100% line as a 118th scale. Um, the guys mm. were going to do something with um, Super Street Magazine. Um, everybody was kind of getting together and, and we got some car companies involved, uh, you know, aftermarket companies like Wings West at the time, uh, Stitchcraft, like all the best of the best of like that early 2000s um, look was kind of crafted into mm -hmm. that car. Um, ultimately, yeah. I really had not much to do with it other than somebody asked me to do an illustration on that particular project. Oh, um, okay. So I did the I did that three quarter illustration that kind of got pushed uh, everywhere. Um, the 118th scale was really a project of Dave's. Um, and even the 164th, I think Alec Tam is technically the designer of record on that car. Um, oh okay you know i think it was one of his I guess, projects I guess, uh, they just grabbed my illustration say, from like some meeting and stuck it on the poster so people uh people oh okay me. <laughs> got it got it because i know some people were uh have you listed as the designer on the fandom this is sort of how you know we try yeah. to figure out who designs what <laughs> yeah and, and, in, and in, projects in like that world. projects like that have lots of hands in them right you know, the, uh, that mm -hmm. was a very high profile project for Hot Wheels. So there were several, several people with a hand in it, you know, whether it was Dave Martis who really sketched up that graphics on it. I think Christina, um, I'm blanking on Christina's last name and it was Al Albrecht. Um, Christina, um, I think she goes by Hot Rod Christina on, uh, on Instagram. She did the actual, uh, Adobe Illustrator files for the project. Um, oh, okay. You know, we we had a lot of different people involved in that particular project, and especially a bunch of us who were kind of doing the young stuff. Um, those of us mm -hmm. who were sort of like, well, me, I was only like twenty two thousand and one. I would have been like twenty three or twenty four years old. Um, hey, that's how know. old I am now. <laughs> Goodness gracious! Um, yeah, there you go. So, you know, for me, uh, that was kind of a project. I was involved with a lot of those companies and a lot of those. Uh, people on the outside. So, uh, that's how kind of I got involved in it. Ah, uh, gotcha. Gotcha. And, and what, uh, what got you into tuner culture? Cause a lot of your designs stem from that culture, you know, uh, yeah. was it just something new. Or just... I think it was, it was the right place in the right time. Um, coming from, uh, I was born and raised outside of Cleveland, Ohio and being kind of a Midwest kid, uh, I had a Mustang in high school and then I had a Chevy S10, you know, mini truck. Um, but when I got to Los Angeles, that mini truck enthusiast that I was starting to connect with and go into some shows and things like that, they were transitioning into tuner cars. They were taking, mm. you know, hatchbacks, you know, Civics, CRXs, Integras, um, those late 90s, uh, you know, classic tuner cars and really starting that movement. And, mm -hmm. you know, I kind of fell in with them uh, through work, you know, um, the kind of cars I was designing in college, the kind of stuff that I was designing was very aggressive, like some of that stuff. And I think it just kind of was a natural fit. Um, eventually, uh, when I bought another car, I bought a, a Mitsubishi Eclipse, and I started, you know, tuning on it, working on it and building it out. And, uh, you know, I was using it as a show car with Hot Wheels for a while. And, um, you know, just kind of, it was kind of a natural evolution into tuner stuff. Um, it was what was mm -hmm. going on. And then my friends outside of work turned into all of these, uh, you know, actually, to be honest, it's, it's pretty wild, but they were all the movers and shakers. They were all the tastemakers in the tuner culture at the time. Um, really <laughs> the guys that were we're building all the great SEMA vehicles and really doing some amazing, uh, you know, innovation and things like that in that world, they ended up becoming some of my, some of my good friends. And, you know, I became that conduit into toys for them. And, uh, and we really, you know, took that, that tuner culture and kind of grew it beyond just guys, you know, getting together at night, uh, in some industrial park or at some car show. Ah, got it. Well, that's cool. Yeah, that's that's awesome though that that whole stuff goes on, uh, sort of perfect timing for everything. Yeah, um, that's that's good stuff. Uh, one one funny thing that I've always found is that 
uh, showstopper gets put on the card of like like when I grew up that that was the card you know it was on everything yeah. you saw showstopper um it just tell me about that design and then also why did it change names <laughs> showstopper is uh, a wild card um I think I drew showstopper in the winter term of 99 when I was uh, still a student we were working on some mm. stunt vehicles and some of the early illustrations of it, the, these were all done by hand. They weren't even done in the computer. These were marker and vellum and, and chalk, wow. um, you know, and with a little bit of gouache on there. Um, that particular illustration was, uh, it had little winglets over the front wheels that were going to grab like mm -hmm. some rails in the track and it would cause the car to do corkscrews or, backflips oh. as it would go off of ramps because the, the continuation of these, um, these rails would cause it to do different things. Um, so they needed a special car for it that kind of looked fast and looked like it would do stunts. And, you know, as I said, I was getting into this tuner world. Nathan really liked all that stuff. He loved like the old import tuner magazine. And mm. we just theorized that these, these cars that were styled with all that aerodynamics would have been the perfect vehicle for something like that. So I sketched it all up. It sat. When I came back after uh, graduation in that, uh, in that 1999 summertime, we had a design contest to kind of fill in the last little bits of what would be the 2000 basic car line. Um, and back uh -huh. then I was hired to work on the innovation team. So I threw some ideas at it. I drew I stayed up in my apartment, just sketched up some ideas, stayed late at work, threw a bunch of things at the wall. Muscle Tone was one of those projects at the time. And I pulled out that sketch of Seared Tuner, which was really called Showstopper at the time because it was Shogun, right? right? Um, <laughs> threw that thing up on the wall. Nathan loved it. Nathan was the guy running uh, you know, basic cars at the time. He was kind of the top guy. And he was really advocating mm -hmm. that we needed to get into this tuner world. Like this was where custom cars were going, right? You'll hear yeah. people talk about, you know, a 57 Chevy, and then they'll talk about muscle cars being the 57 Chevy of the sixties and seventies. And then you'll talk about mini trucks from the eighties and nineties being the 57 Chevy of that era. And then you had the tuner uh, cars like the Honda civic being the 57 Chevy of its era, <laughs> um, a, sort of a basic car that somebody puts their, um, puts their own personalization to. And so mm -hmm. Nathan really advocated that we stick it in the line. Um, we threw it in the line in 2000, um, you know, came out on the original card with sort of that uh, sort of a Dodge stealth looking uh, rear three quarter shot. It comes out on that card. And then for 2001, there is a desire to do new card art. We need a new car on the card. Um, you, I think we had a logo change at the time to something with a realistic flame. The blue yeah, gets a little yeah. darker, almost a more purpley blue. And, mm -hmm. you know, leadership at Hot Wheels at the time wanted to change the image, you know, kind of give us a new millennium image, right? Everything at that time was, you know, the millennium, you know, Y2K and the uh, millennium's over. And by 2001, everybody was kind of, let's move forward. And yeah. at the time there were, the senior management was like, this tuner stuff's not going away. We might as well embrace it. And that's how the car ended up on the uh, front of every car package for a couple, two, three years there. Wow. That's cool. Yeah, I know. And, and like I said, that's what we grew up with. You know, it, it's kind of funny. I, shoot, I was probably like one years old when that happened. And just, <laughs> <laughs> but that's just like iconic. You know, it, it's kind of funny. I, I sort of miss... Um, like a one car being on the the packaging because now it's like every car has their own packaging um, yeah there was some talk about that even way back then about like in because you know technically every card was individualized back then in the in the mm -hmm. 60s you know in 68 69 in those earliest days of hot wheels the only thing that changed was what's called the black plate so they would print all those cards and then they would come in and just print the name and some of the black ink um, would change oh, yeah. that plate would change um, to you know go from twin mill to beach bomb right right so the card never really changed 
by the time the technology changes in the 80s and 90s, those cards were largely individual anyway. They had different cross sells oh. on them. They had different information, um, especially the ones that were part of series cards. Um, you know, all mm-hmm. of those types of things changed. So technically, they were already doing individual cards. They just never took it to the next level. And I think where they're at now is the whole package is like a complete product where the package is meant to be um, almost like a trading card where you don't want to wreck it. You want it to stay mm-hmm. intact and hold that car um, and really be a complete unit uh, from a collector standpoint anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. No, it makes sense. And I actually didn't know that about them having that technology back then that they just didn't choose to do it uh, beforehand. Yeah. So I mean, we talked about it because we were doing cool sketches and we always wanted our cool sketches to get more light of day. Uh, you know, most of the time and the only time that you would ever see those sketches would be like on the poster that people would send in for um and oh, so okay. those those little tiny like two inch by two inch illustrations we were like we would spend hours those illustrations are like 18 by 24 inches they're big um they're at least the size yeah. of a piece of paper um if not larger um i used to draw kind of big format stuff um mm-hmm. and you know, we always just wanted to share that art with the world. So um, mm. that was really the idea, I think, originally behind trying to change that art out. I think now they're doing kind of almost like a CGI representation of every car. Yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. It, it's it's. I think I think they model it, and yeah. then they just they hand it over to the. I think an the, illustrator I don't know. illustrates the model. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I, I don't I don't know the full thing, but yeah. It comes uh, off a little sterile to me. It's not as um, it's not as exciting as as a piece of true art. I think in some cases, mm. because they are really drawing a product, and a lot of yeah. people working on it, I think treat those illustrations like products as opposed to like cars. Um, so you mm. see things like the wheels, which are clearly modeled. They're really Hot Wheels wheels. When we would draw, yeah, a more accurate automotive wheel on our original, you know, yeah. concept sketches back in the day. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Yeah, I, I I have noticed that. I mean, it feels it looks like plastic. I mean, it looks like the plastic model. It doesn't look like, yeah, you know, the an actual thing that could exist. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. And if you're uh, and if you're talking about the way they like the way that they took Showstopper and kind of illustrated it on the package, I mean, they did it in these like blues, like it was racing at night with the lights lit yeah. up and the the wheels spinning. Like there was a lot of attitude in that drawing. Yeah, even in that yeah. illustration and. And there was attitude in the previous illustration, like that Dodge Stealthy looking thing from the rear three quarter. It was like, it was almost like, yeah, it was oh yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that one, across yeah. the package. It was really neat. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, those kinds of, those kinds of things have evolved a little bit. Um, you see more of that kind of art, I think, in the collector line of product now. Yeah. You know what they're yeah. Doing. yeah, definitely. Uh, oh, did you? I guess we didn't talk about how did Showstopper turn into Seared Tuner? What, what what was the reason for that? I just, I just so think it's funny. We, we named it Showstopper, S-H-O-Stopper, because um, it was sort mm-hmm. of a Shogun thing. It was a Showstopper of a car. Um, it had all these yeah. reasons. And and at least initially, it cleared legal. They blessed it. Uh, I think the guy's name was Michael Dewart at the time. Um, he he was like, yeah, it's fine. Every you know, We went out. I th- I'm pretty sure we trademarked it. And then about yeah. a year or so later, um, a doll company had the rights in, in the toy category. Uh, it had come up that they had owned the rights to showstoppers or something along that line. S H O W, uh, was a line of fashion doll clothes. Um, and Mattel <laughs> rather than, rather than fight changed it. And, okay. uh, I will not name names. I was never a fan of the name. Um, I think somebody was having fun up in packaging, one of the copywriters, and he would like, oh, it's like a seared tuna, right? Because it's fish. It's Japanese. And he thought it <laughs> no. was funny. And I hated it. And I still oh, no. hate it. Um, it was the worst name change that could have ever happened. Um, oh, no. And, and ultimately, I wasn't consulted. The projects kind of shift hands uh, for the casting designer. They usually get to kind of see a project through to its first edition state, and then it's kind of gone. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. I, 
I'm sure I wrote a nasty email to somebody that was well above my pay grade and, and caused some problem for Nathan or John Handy or somebody about the name change. Um, I guarantee I did that because I was well known for that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, um, you know, but the name stuck and, and it has stuck ever since. Um, I think yeah. I think the lore of a name change, though, adds to the um, kind of fantasy of the car and kind of the story behind the car. Mm hmm. Yeah, well, it did. Uh, I think I know fans are going to want to know. Trust me. I know some people are like, why was the change? You know, a lot of I mean, a lot of die are like, like the that. Car. The original illustration was red because uh, I liked red. It's my favorite color. Yeah. Um, I think we got down to releasing the cars and everybody was like, we have so many red Ferraris. There's going to be too many red cars at retail. Eric, you have to change your car. So it became <laughs> yellow, um, you know, uh, it was a cool yellow. Uh, Carlos yeah. uh, and I mixed up a, a pearl yellow in the back and the factory matched it pretty neat. It was a pretty neat color. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it ended up being yellow. And then uh, there was a recolor. You know, back then they used to do a lot of recolors, just release them with some random number on a package that did come out in red eventually. Um, I think I tapped, I tapped the shoulder of one of the graphics guys and I was like, you know, it'd be, I'd be really, really happy if you made it red. <laughs> <laughs> no please please yeah. make it red <laughs> this is i'm not threatening but no threatening. no i mean back you know no. most everybody was pretty good friends um especially right. back then i was really good friends with all the, all the designers across uh, the different aspects of the hot wheels team especially so when little when there were little projects like that that popped up you know everybody tried to help each other a little bit right yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm sure it was either Wayne or Mike uh, Wilmon or even, maybe even Mike McClone who, who was recoloring the car, uh, possibly even Peter Karras. Uh, one of those guys probably had the project and I walked by and I was like, please make it. And they just did. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Which actually that uh, I wanted to know, like, what is, what is it like to work at Hot Wheels, you know, just in general? Uh, you know, what I mean, is that like my experience, you know, it's been a while now, um, you know, it's been 20 years since I started there, uh, almost mm -hmm. 20 years, it's been 18 years since I left, um, yeah. I left in Oh four. Um, so, you know, my experience there, I was one of the youngest guys. I was fresh out of school. Um, I was working along all these talented guys. I was having conversations much like yourself. You said you're like 25 years old and you're talking to some guy in his, in his mid forties. I was, I was doing the same thing. And I was like, oh, I loved He-Man when I was a kid. And they're like, oh, yeah. designed He-Man, right? Like you walk, past, <laughs> like, you walk past the boys action team and you'd see like Dave Wolfram and you're like, yeah, designed that. Mike Andrews. Like, oh, that's cool. Some of these guys, they made my childhood. So I was stoked yeah. to work alongside of them, asked a lot of questions, really just tried to draw as much stuff as I could. Um, my number one tool at the time and often for me is to just sketch, just to draw stuff. Um, it can be really a simple napkin sketch, just a quick doodle in a meeting. And I can really capture, um, the essence of an idea. Um, and so a lot of times I'd have my head down as the conversation was going on and I'm sketching everything I hear, sketch, 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 sketch. And then I'm like, <laughs> okay, Hey everybody. They're like, okay, well, we'll have a meeting next week. I'm like, but yeah, but I got it. It's right here. Right. It's done. Oh. <laughs> and everybody would be like, yeah, that's basically it. Can you go color it in now? Right. Cause I'd usually just yeah. have like a ballpoint pen. <laughs> um, and so that was kind of one of my, you know, my ways of working and, you know, working alongside some of these guys and, uh, was really exciting. Larry Wood, um, you know, mm. uh, I think he made me work hard for, for his friendship, uh, for his mentorship, oh, yeah. um, you know, but, uh, I think it was worth the time and I've thanked him for years since, uh, for, for all he was able to, uh, kind of give me, um, uh, Nathan mm. in particular was a strong mentor, uh, uh, Alton Takayasu took a lot of time with me um, when he was running Boys Action, um, which was kind of nice because he wasn't in Hot Wheels, but he had an affinity towards it. So as I worked on different cars, a lot of times, you know, Nathan and, and Alton were good friends. Um, I'd go talk to, to Alton and he'd kind of give me some thoughts on some different things. So, um, you know, in general, I wouldn't be where I'm at today with the knowledge I had without having spent those, you know, those you know, four and a half, five years working alongside some of those guys. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's just so cool. I mean, like for me, I'm, I'm literally that kid that's just like sort of somehow, some way I, I got to at least 
get a chance to talk to y'all and just uh like when i met brian i was like oh my gosh you created my childhood <laughs> uh so no for real um i did want to ask is there did you ever have any um relationship with video game stuff because they definitely use a lot of uh designs from like early 2000s like velocity x and world race and stunt track challenge they used a lot of um you already made stuff for those so did they consult you for that or is it just uh i did get involved in some of those projects it just depended on who was running them at the time um i'm blanking as to who the original video game guy was but he left and went to thq he was a friend mm. of nathan's i think that was stunt track driver um okay we stunt- oh yeah 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 i love that game when we were doing the original stunt track driver, like, you know, I got, I got brought in to consult on it a little bit, right. You know, Nathan and I would go to some meetings with, uh, with the guys and we would, we would talk about Hot Wheels and what made Hot Wheels cool and, and the attitudes mm-hmm. behind it and, you know, how to capture speed, power, performance, and attitude, which was really the tagline yeah. back then. Um, so we would get involved and we try to figure out how to make it as cool as we could, but still also for younger kids because the brand was, really popular with like say three to five year olds, but we wanted to make sure it still had this automotive cool and didn't get too preschooly. Um, mm-hmm. so stunt track driver was one of the first video games I worked on. Um, velocity X is the one I think has MST Suzuka on the cover of it. Yep. Um, that yep. one was done. I think Amy Boylan's team by that point was doing, uh, it was like new media, Mattel media or something like that. Um, you know, I was definitely brought in to talk a little bit about it. I worked on some of the cars. A lot of times those special projects would fall to Nathan Proach. And um, okay. one, of, one of the things that I was really good at in my early years of Hot Wheels, and I was young, so I didn't have a family to go running home to. I had a few extra hours. Uh, I definitely <laughs> wanted to impress people. Um, and I would function as, you know, oftentimes Nathan's right hand. Yeah. So again, you know, Nathan was oftentimes the guy behind a lot of these special projects. Um, you know, they often task him with, you know, the heart and soul of the Hot Wheels brand. Um, Mm -hmm. and because I was a hard worker and somebody who kind of, you know, positioned myself, you know, alongside of him was like, Hey, I'll, I'll do anything. Right. I want to grow. I want to learn. Um, he would often bring me to those meetings, um, you know, maybe to just sit and listen initially, or then talk to him afterwards. And I would bring, you know, a lot of my knowledge as a younger guy. And I talked to Nathan and he would coach me on how to present those ideas and and bring those things to life. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, the thing that, you know, you've heard, you know, whether it's that Honda civic story, you know, Mm -hmm. hot wheels is a team. It's a large group, right? There were probably, 15, 20 designers, plus the graphics side of the team. When you added all of us together, that's a lot of brain power and a lot of really talented people. So not every project was a hundred percent one guy. It's not like an art project by one person. It's more like five or six people get involved. Maybe somebody just throws an idea out in a meeting and you take it and add it. Uh, Another person might get involved and help you problem solve something. Uh, Mm. Especially in those early days of my career, at Mattel, um, I was working with people, um, on a lot of projects, um, you know, or oftentimes I would be pointed to somebody for, all right, Hey, you got it most of the way there. Go see Larry. He'll help you figure it out the rest, you know, or go talk to Nathan. So it's kind of how that stuff worked out. That's neat. And for, I do want to try and get to world race a little bit. Uh, do you have any big involvement in world race or, so World Race, again, you know, uh, it was a big project, right? That was the 35th anniversary of Hot Wheels. We wanted to do 35 new tooled cars. There was a whole bunch of different ideas thrown around at the time. Um, and, you know, in that span, uh, we wanted to have each of the teams that we created. And all of it, like, was kind of done by a committee. There was a bunch of us kind of throwing ideas. Again, it was really something that fell under Nathan with a lot oh, yeah. of a lot of people looking at it. Right. I think Ian Richter was responsible for the entertainment at the time. And he was just like a young producer. Uh, You know, John Handy, everybody, I mean, it was 35, you know, 35th anniversary. All of these things were just, it was a big deal. Yeah. Um, And, you know, they wanted some new cars. 
They wanted some old cars, cars that represented different decades and different eras within Hot Wheels. So you'll see teams have like the Diora two ends up in that group. Um, oh, you yeah. know, the, uh, the twin mill is in that group, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, there's a lot of very popular Hot Wheels cars that kind of get put in different teams um, mm-hmm. because those cars represented things collectors liked, things children liked, cars that had um, a bit more of a story than just some of the other ones. Um, yeah. I was lucky enough to get to design one of the new tools. Uh, the Switchback was one of my vehicles at the time. Yeah. You know, um, kind of a retro modern, uh, you know, kind of a take on an F100. Um, I was getting known when I did the uh, muscle tone and, and vehicles like that. I was kind of my take on what maybe Detroit should be designing and, mm. and how they could take some history and, you know, update it, make it cool for today's kind of technology and street. So, you know, I got to do the, to do that truck. And then I, you know, sort of designed a truck that was like an F100. Then I slammed it. Then I two toned it. Then yeah. I put surfboards on it. Cause surfboards were cool on all my hot wheels cars. When They're I was always kid. cool. Always cool. I wanted to put <laughs> surfboards on a car. So I just did it. Yeah. Um, you know, and so I was lucky enough to get involved in that. Um, I was definitely lucky enough to be involved in the consulting on the entertainment side of it. You know, there was, again, a lot of us in a room. So the ideas get all kind of jumbled together. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, there was a bunch of us. We pulled in the male action guys. I think Ruben Martinez worked on a lot of the early character design work from the, from mm-hmm. the boys action side of things. Um, you know, oftentimes they would pull pull the designers who they thought were the new hot shots with the new kind of look on things that might be able to give the project a new hip, cool take on things. Right. Um, you know, and, and surprisingly the marketing guys would use those exact terms, which often made us cringe as, as designers. <laughs> it's the hip, cool it's new the thing. Hip. Woo, put a Z on the end. Go. Yeah. Um, we would all be like, Ooh, but, <laughs> but, they weren't wrong. They were really looking to the new young talent and trying to inspire them to do something that hadn't been done before and was different so that they could kind of take a new twist on things. And so World Race yeah. was very successful for us. Um, at the time, kids were still watching uh, video cassettes and DVDs. Um, and mm. that product came out, the DVDs came out with a lot of the products with episodes. Um, they also ran some of it, I think on Cartoon Network, I think at the time. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, And, and that stuff was, you know, never really featured at the best times of day, but kids found it and loved it. And, and young kids at that age group, they would get their copy of that DVD and they'd watch it. Like, I want to say the average was like 40 times. Uh, they had done some market research (laughs) and a kid would get like Shrek the movie and they, they would watch it every day. You know, a five-year-old kid would like, I like Shrek come home from school, Shrek, right? Next day, Shrek, next day, (laughs) Shrek, next day, Shrek. Yeah. You know, I I have a a daughter who's 26. She watched Barbie and the Nutcracker and Shrek every day for like, what seemed like a whole year. Uh, It was probably (laughs) not quite a whole year, but she definitely watched them probably at least 50 times each. Oh man. Uh, and, and, And that's the stuff that I think for me personally, where my career has gone, um, I've been very, very blessed to have, um, inspired a whole generation of kids through those types of projects. Um, you know, I became pretty well known for being in living in that space between vehicles, uh, because of my background, but animation and sort of culture and kids, um, whether it was world race, whether it was my involvement in accelerators before I left. Um, or the things that I was doing at Spin Master with, you know, helping to create Paw Patrol and helping mm. to work on other animated properties. I was able to kind of help kids, you know, enjoy stuff, right? And inspire yeah. them. So, you know, they watch a show and then they go and play it out with their toys or they play it out in the schoolyard, you know. And yep. uh, being able to be part of a brand like Hot Wheels in particular, um, like Paw Patrol and being able to help um, inspire kids has really been a blessing for me, really, um, very fulfilling, uh, you know, aspect of what I've done. Yeah. No, well, Hey, look, I can attest. I I watched my 
world race dvd probably thousands of times now at this point it's you know it's just one of those things i just grew up on it and then uh and it's funny because you mentioned the school ground playground like literally that's that was me and my friends uh one i i had a sketch um one of my guys had a switchback and i had uh i think crazy eights at the time and we swap them every now and then and i would swap this sketch on my wall from switchback to crazy eights which depending on which one i had at the time nice. so you know it's i mean that was just a big impact on me uh as a kid i guess and it was just just a good good overall thing um and i know people are going to want to ask you know what was it like designing uh accelerators cars because obviously uh power rage is vert wheeler's car everyone loves it drift tech and uh, mm -hmm. spec tight uh, the most expensive accelerators car i think right now uh, five hundred dollars <laughs> each <laughs> my my guess is it was released at the end and they didn't release very many of it it's probably that's, why. yeah that's about probably the that's main it. reason why it's worth a lot of money is because it's rare <laughs> yeah yeah oh yeah <laughs> oh come on you got to give yourself some credit there you know it's pretty iconic in the show it's driven for like uh, an episode i think <laughs> <laughs> Which meant it was probably released in fewer quantities compared to yeah. something like Power Rage that I think came with the card game and other stuff. So yeah, um, you know uh, that was right near the time where I left Mattel. Um, you know I had worked on a lot of those things. Um, I, I think I recently looked uh, before we got together and you sent me some some notes. I looked up Spectite. Yeah. Like, Why is this thing worth so much money? Um, <laughs> I guarantee it was because it's it's in low quantities more than anything. But uh, yeah. It attributes Mark Jones to finishing that car off for me after I had left. Um, he did a great job of just kind of adapting what I had started. Um, you know, when we did World, when we did Acceleracers, that was actually, I was probably the lead project designer, product designer on that. Um, oh, wow. Larry Wood did most of the like Metal Maniac stuff or Scorchers. Yeah. It's Metal Maniacs, I think. Metal Maniacs, yeah. I talked to him about that, actually. He was He was saying he did like, four or five, I think. Yeah. Uh, him, Phil Realman did a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we had some guys on the outside, Harold Belker. And um, I want to say the last name of the other guy was Hill. They did a lot of the silencers. Um, you know, these were some, some Hollywood uh, designers that we had been working with oh, guys wow. famous for doing things like Batmobile. Uh, yeah. Some really good stuff. And so I was kind of the lead on all of that stuff um, at the time when I was leaving. And, uh, you know, the, the team finished them all off and, you know, the, the sh stuff ended up in the shows in different capacities. And um, I kind of went on my, my career path at that point, but left that stuff for, you know, young guys like you. There were kids who who loved all that stuff. Um, you know, they got they got a, a little longer run out of it than I think they originally anticipated. I think it lasted a little bit uh, a little bit deeper. Um, you know, it was cool. It was cool to be able to do that kind of stuff. And and really craft a world, craft a story, uh, you know, working alongside the producers and the writers. Um, we'd get invited to various writer rooms and we would bring, uh, I want to think we, we had something called a sweeper. It was basically like a car with a big wheel that picked up other cars. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, yeah. Like, we're like the, the bad guy should have this thing, right? <laughs> it should go around and it should pick up cars and like, it should be driving behind them trying to eat up cars. Right. Yeah. And so that's the kind of stuff I learned, you know, those early days of like, you'd come to a writer's meeting and a lot of times they look at a toy and they're like, you just want to sell a toy. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, that's true. We do want to yep. sell a toy, <laughs> but we also have some really neat ideas of how this could be used in a show situationally. Yep. Like, this could happen. And then all of a sudden, after the writers laughed at us a little bit or joked amongst themselves, they'd be like, they'd go home and they'd be like, that thing those guys showed me was pretty neat. It was pretty cool. You know, and then they might write something for it. You know, they'll come mm -hmm. up with some way the aliens used it to do whatever. Um, and yeah. so being able to be a part of that um, was really neat. You know, that whole process. Um, you know, it, things like things like Acceleracers and World Race really set me up to be able to do bigger projects like Paw Patrol later on. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I did have a question uh, relating to one of the, the uh, motorcycles. I don't know mm -hmm. if you know, uh, they didn't release motorcycles, but I, we also don't really know who designed some of them like a uh, nightlife. Do you know, or is, 
that going to be lost to history <laughs> or to someone else that may know? <laughs> The, the guy who probably knows about nightlife would probably be Mark Jones. Um, okay. I get the feeling that Mark probably handled a lot of acceleracers after I left. Um, it probably mm. landed on his desk. Um, some of the stuff got finished by Dwayne Vance at the time. Right. Uh, you know, th- those guys probably were the ones that handled a lot of that stuff. Um, the motorcycle I remember mostly was a bike that I think came out later that Phil Reelman had done. It was like an all engine bike that was, yeah, the it's airy eight, I think. Well, it's now airy eight. It was, uh, I think uh, jackhammer or something like that. Yeah. And those, uh, you know, that bike had, you know, originally been intended to be a bike for the metal maniacs. Mm -hmm. Nightlife sounds like the name that they would have given a bike for the, Taku, yep, and yep. it just never happened. Yeah, you know? uh, motorcycles were popular at the time. Um, Scorch and Scooter was a relatively new casting, you know, from the from the late '90s that had done very very well. Uh, they followed it up with Blast Lane. Um, mm-hmm. We had the Dodge Tomahawk in the line. Oh yeah, the motorcycle, oh, yeah. and we had these motorcycle wheels that were getting used every so often. I think there was a there was a three-wheel Buick, uh, or I'm sorry, a BMW type vehicle that had like a big old swing arm with a single wheel in the back, uh, mm. say about 1999 or 98 first editions. I think Bruce Bauer had done that. Uh, yeah. BMW Izetta, I think was what it was loosely based on. Um, and collectors really, really liked motorcycles. The, the, mm-hmm collector community particularly the adults were like these are cool we want more of these yeah so we would have likely added them to the line and then they either got nixed for one of two reasons or a combination of both of those reasons which would have been cost motorcycles Mm -hmm. can get a little bit more expensive even with less wheels sometimes Mm -hmm. um and then more likely marketing at the time looked at acceleracers as a kid targeted program. So the intent was all the vehicles work on track. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. So that makes sense. Did, like when we did world race, I made switchback super duper low. It's like a, yeah, it doesn't really work car. on the track very well. <laughs> it barely drives over a piece of paper. I was quite proud yeah. of that. Um, you know, <laughs> it'll, hit, it'll bump into a trading card. It lays out. It is nice. Um, but uh, there were, there was a there was a group of people at the time, uh, you know, particularly on the kids side going, if this is a kid targeted program, the car should work on track. And, yeah, you know, we had like level one, two, three and four. And the the expectations that most of these cars needed to be like threes and fours, they needed to really work on track. Um, mm. You know, whereas some of the designs I was responsible for, I mean, MST Suzuka in a great track car. Yeah, um, nope, it's not. But it looks great. <laughs> showstopper, not so great on track. Yeah. Um, the, uh, Buick Riviera, uh, it's a 64 Rivi is really, really nice. Really low. <laughs> <laughs> it's too low. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that, I, that makes sense, you know, with the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I, I did want to ask after moving away from Hot Wheels, have you seen some of the retools of some of your designs? Have you ever thought about like, man, did they have to do that or <laughs> I, I'll tell you this. Some of my vehicles, when they retool them, I wish I was still there because mm. to me, the retool is an opportunity to make a change. Um, yeah. A really great example is the rockster. So the rockster's mm-hmm. construction originally had a plastic roof with a roof rack and it was intended to look like a Jeep's roof, right? Like that was kind of our take on like, yeah. What if Hummer did a little Hummer that kind of was a Jeep? My original sketch has like short rear doors. It was kind of like in the vein of an FJ cruiser. Um, yeah. You know, very Hummer like very tank like, um, and it was supposed to have a completely removable Jeep like roof. And then they retooled Mm -hmm. it and they copied that roof and just did it in all metal. And I'm like, yeah, (laughs) in my head, I would have designed it as if it had a metal roof, right? If Mm. it was a metal roof variant, like, you know, when you buy a Jeep with a hard top on it, it has a different profile, a different shape than a Jeep that has a soft. Yeah. And so I would have, 
I would have liked to have been around to be able to redesign that vehicle um, just a little bit because I think it would have made a variation of the vehicle that I think collectors would have loved a lot. Um, and it wouldn't have mm. cost that much time or effort, right? Um, I could have put a different roof rack yeah. on it and really accounted for the fact that this thing is now a hard top. Uh, mm. You know, I was there when they filled in the wing on Super Tuned. Um, and so the wing oh. doesn't have to pass <laughs> through because it was difficult yep. to, uh, it was difficult to manufacture. So they took that, that, uh, what they call thin steel in a slide out, um, so that that didn't mm. do it anymore. Um, showstoppers whole front grill has changed the sides have changed on it, right? Cause it yeah. used to have these little inserts that made it look like carbon fiber, a whole little panel that kind of slid in, um, in a unique yep. way. Um, yep. I know that. For cost to keep Hot Wheels cars down in price, most of the true basic cars now are are dropping construction um, to limit mm -hmm. labor. Labor being yep. probably the most expensive component of a Hot Wheels car at this point. Um, in order to keep those things down around a dollar, they had to come up with creative ways to make them simpler to produce. And yeah, you know the the types of things that really the top designers. Phil Realman was probably one of the best at it uh mark jones mm -hmm. as well but phil used to take like he used to take like the mini cooper and he'd have like a little slide a little switch in the in the chassis that would was sandwiched between the interior and the chassis that would like latch the body on so then you could take the body off the mini cooper uh yeah you know he phil took a lot of time to put features in cars um mm -hmm. that they really don't have in those 99 cent cars anymore um, yeah, you get that yeah. kind of stuff at, in a collector grade car, but not so much in the 99 cent vehicle. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, I think it's a little loss, you know, to me, uh, those little discoveries that kids who love Hot Wheels find out about those is what keeps them in the brand and keeps them loving those things for, for many years. I'm sure you discovered all of those little Easter eggs um, and and enjoyed them. And it, yep. and it, it gave you more uh, more excitement around the product. Um, as you realize, oh, I could do this to this car. And then you're digging through a bucket of cars to find. Yeah. Them. Yeah. I think one of those is like hyperliner. You can take the whole body off yep. and you can switch it with a different one mm -hmm. and just mix and match sort of, or, uh, yep. even the surfboards. I mean, you could, you could take surfboards off of switchback and put different ones on if you wanted to. Yeah. You could get the uh, ones off Diora, you know, and kind of yeah. them in and, and, and make some different stuff. Um, I think, you know, as kids get a little older, they like doing that kind of stuff. Um, as their fingers get better and they get a little more creative, they're like, they're like, yeah, I want to be involved in that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I can say that. I am glad that like MST Suzuka is coming back because uh, for a while it hadn't been in. Uh, it I'm is coming always, back. I love, I love it. I know some people ask me all the time, do you get paid off this? No, I don't get any royalties. <laughs> uh but I really, really love that the cars that I worked on all those years ago continue to show up in the line. Um, whenever yeah. they show up, it's just, it really it makes me smile, you know? Yeah. That they're still, no, I, they're still cool enough that they're using them. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I, I think it's, it's great that, uh, like, I rem like with our community, everyone was going nuts. They're like, oh my gosh, MST's back. MST's back, guys. It's in the main line. Let's go. Everything's going to be hunky-dory now. You know, yep. <laughs> Everything's good. Um, it, it didn't look like it had too much change either, which is sort of nice that it's just, it's whatever the two rivet rule. Yeah. The two rivet rule. The the real the real punishment was on Diora 2. That, that poor car hasn't had a break <laughs> in retools, that's for sure. No, I imagine um, that back window has changed quite a bit. Cause it was kind of a weird undercut <laughs> and uh, they got, I'm sure they got yep. the surfboards and uh, yep. <laughs> the engines just molded as a big chunk of painted crap. In the back. <laughs> um, yeah. It's unfortunate. Yeah. Well, it's just, but, it's just whatever. But the way to look at that is the car is so iconic and was such a good design and so timely for when it was produced um, and, and mm -hmm. such an integral part of Hot Wheels history that they continue to take the time to retool it because fans still want it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. Uh, which That's actually, cool. cause I'm thinking, you know, with the legend store and stuff, they're bringing the real Dior two out to people and they get to see it and then they want to go collect it. Yep. Um, one, one thing I had to ask you is if you could take any of your designs and make it a real life hot wheels car, which one would it be? 
I mean, man, I, I, I kind of got some of it, right? Like Showstopper was kind of an eclipse and kind of the way I did my eclipse was yeah. like that. Um, when I did MST, or I'm sorry, when I did Muscle Tone, it was kind of a look at a fifth gen Camaro and mm-hmm. the new Camaro came out and it's pretty close. Um, yeah. You know, I had friends who worked at GM and they bought cases of those cars because they were like, oh, this is kind of cool. <laughs> um, yeah. Well before that thing hit the street. Um, you know, there are variations. I worked on um, 40 something was kind of a take on a GT40. Yeah. Um, and, and ultimately yep. they've, Ford has done that car twice since I did mine. And, you know, those cars are really cool. I, I really enjoy that they went that direction. The, um, the switchback, that F100 kind of looking thing, there are there are, are elements of that design that show up in today's Ford Maverick. Um, yeah. You know, that, that dog bone grill. Um, so there, there are cars out there that I get to, to say or, or see that kind of, brought to life some of my designs or, or similar. I didn't do a ton of crazy stuff uh, per se that I'm like, man, I really wish, you know, somebody would build a, you know, a six engine car. I didn't do anything oh, yeah. quite like that. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe um, well, I mean, I, I guess I did motocross um, was kind oh. of wild, but yeah, that's kind of what those like, those desert razors and stuff are now those side-by-side vehicles are kind of yeah. motorcycles with four wheels. Um, mm-hmm. So I feel like if I really wanted to bring one of my cars to life, there's something out there I could start with that would get me close. Um, yeah. You know, I, I guess the one I wish I had the most, um, it would probably be a rockster. Um, mm. You know, I, I really wanted to do something like that. I did. I do own an H3. I bought it in 06. I still have it. Um, oh. It's kind of in that vein. I, but I just yeah. wish I could have, like, could have had that Hummer. I wish GM didn't go through the problems that they went through and really could have done that Jeep-like Hummer um, with mm-hmm. a true, ho- you know, soft top and all of that. And Yeah. You know, the other side of that is um, the Rockster. It, it actually inspired my son's first name. Um, years later, oh, so okay. I designed that car in '02. When my son was born in '08, um, and when we, my wife and I, my wife, I met her working at Mattel. I sat um, a pretty blonde gal next to me in a cube next <laughs> to me, uh, and twenty something years later, we're we're still together, and we have, we have our own kids. And uh, my son, uh, his name is Roxton, R O X T O N, because oh. <laughs> when my wife and I were thinking of kid names. Um, we were thinking of cars and I'm like, well, we can name him Ford. We can name him, you know, um, Austin Healy, uh, you know, Oh yeah. Her, her dad's name is Martin. Um, I carry my grandfather's, uh, first name as my middle name. And so she liked the idea of, of Aston Martin. And I was like, ain't, ain't no chance. Cause <laughs> schoolyard is not a kind place. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, um, you know, we were looking at things like Harley and, 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 and so, uh, I had done the Rockster and I was like, we like the sound of, of this S T O N S T I N on the end. And so I was like, well, what mm-hmm. about R O X T O N Roxton? And I was like, Ooh, I like that. And I was like, yeah, we'll call him rocks. And that's his name. And so there it would go. be really wild to have that car come to life, uh, because of that <laughs> story. Um, I yeah. think it would just be super rad for, for him and I. No, that's awesome. That's, that's so wholesome. That's, that's so good. Um, uh, I think you talked about it a little bit. Uh, what, what are some of the other die cast brands you worked for or just so, maybe like a little speed stuff for. Yeah. So, so I left, I went to work, uh, at Jada toys. I worked on a bunch of products with them, you know, whether it was import racer, dub city, all of those different brands that they had. Oh yeah. Chubb city. Um, it was a very short stop. I, I, I wanted to spread my wings and do some management stuff and get into other sides of product development. Um, Jada afforded me an opportunity to, to make some more money and, and, and test myself there. Um, I quickly jumped to work for what at the time was RC2. Today is Tomy out of Chicago. Uh, they owned Johnny mm. Lightning at the time, but I went there to help do JL Full Throttle. with. Uh, we did the Foose line of die cast. We did overhauling cars and we did a bunch oh, of trucks wow. and a bunch of other stuff for, for about a two year window. Um, 
then I moved to San Diego um, and started working on uh, with Upper Deck on a bunch of products. I did a bunch of sports figures and, and various other stuff uh, around sports and then went up to Spin Master. Um, and at Spin Master, I ran the preschool division and I really brought like a lot of that edge and attitude, brought it into a preschool formula. And mm-hmm. you know, that became Paw Patrol and Rusty Ribbits and a bunch of other different uh, things that we had done there. So that's the speed that's cool. story of where my career yeah. is. <laughs> well, it, I mean, we, I was just thinking because we don't have too much time left. Um, mm-hmm. I did want to just ask, you know, you, you've you gone into professional cornhole and I'll, and I'll end with this is the whole, how'd you get in professional cornhole? <laughs> <laughs> well, so how'd I get it? Um, you know, yeah. Um, I blame my wife uh, a little bit. Um, my son, when he was in uh, first grade, my wife signed me up for this father-son camping group. Uh, today they call it the Adventure Guides through the YMCA. So I go camping with a bunch of dads uh, on a beach here on Camp Pendleton. I was on Del Mar Beach. Uh, somebody brought out some wood boards and some some bags filled with corn, and we started throwing them around, um, you know, as dads will, with the with the beverage yeah. in our hand. And uh, <laughs> the kids were playing and being boys, uh, which was amazing because in Southern California, there's not a lot of open space to be a boy. So we mm. we let the kids go out and be kids, and we played cornhole. I got good at it. Uh, started playing locally and found a saw it on TV and told my wife, I'm gonna go pro. Uh, <laughs> I saw, you know, Johnsonville ACL on TV. And, uh, years later, I'm, uh, I'm fully into cornhole. I now work for a cornhole company. I run all their apparel business. Um, I throw cornhole professionally. I'll be entering my third season as a professional cornhole player. Wow. On the, on the pro <laughs> tour. Um, you know, and I've played alongside the guys everybody sees on TV. I've beaten some of them. Uh, they beat me probably more than I beat them. But, uh, <laughs> you know, today for today, I'm one of the two, 300 best players in the country. That's sweet. Yeah. I just I, I remember just following you on Instagram and being like, what is what is professional cornhole? I've never heard of a but professional. To be honest with you, it's another excuse not to grow up, as my wife will tell you. Um <laughs> You know, like I said, to start this all off from the beginning, I said, you know, I I was into toys when I got to high school. I had to put them away because it wasn't cool. Um, I got into design because I wanted to never really grow up. I wanted to be doing fun and exciting things. Um, Mm -hmm. Cornhole is absolutely fun and exciting. It's super stressful, but the highs and the lows are incredible. And uh, to be able to do that, uh, travel the country, throw bags, meet people, um, some people... I cross paths with, and they're they're like, oh, I played with your Hot Wheels cars, and it's it's wild how my oh, cool. how my life kind of all these different avenues come together at times. It's it's pretty wild. Mm-hmm. No, that's awesome. And then uh, the final speed round is uh, a favorite character from the Hot Wheels shows, a favorite Accelerator's car, and or Hot Wheels diecast if so, you want to do so that. Favorite character is probably Vert, just because he's every kid, right? Yep. Um, what's the next one? Just run them down. Acceleracers car. Uh, my favorite car, um, it, from Acceleracers or just, yeah, it's from, from Acceleracers or world race. E- either one. It would have uh, to be those probably two, the power rage or the switchback, but probably okay. the power rage. Got it. Got it. And then, uh, hot wheels die cast in general could be anything from what you designed to anyone's, you know? Um, you know, my, my <laughs> personal favorite car that, that I designed was probably, uh, probably Showstopper. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I really, really enjoyed the way that, that car turned out. Um, you know, and, and I have so many great cars from so many of the other, uh, designers, you know, that, that inspired me while I was there. I probably couldn't name one, you know? Got it. Um, yeah, no, I get it. And, uh, lastly, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me online. I mean, it's really easy. Um, I, I don't hide. I'm under Eric, E-R-I-C, and T-S-C-H-E-R-N-E. It's, it's pretty easy to find me mm-hmm. on Facebook. It's pretty easy to find me on Instagram. Um, you'll see me on YouTube if you want to learn how to throw a cornhole bag. Um, yep. You know, uh, the Cornhole <laughs> yeah. Network guys have a, a bunch of great videos with me in it. Um, you might see me on ESPN. <laughs> you know. Hey, that's cool, though. 
That's you know? cool. Um, and, yeah. and, and occasionally I still get to some conventions. Uh, some of the, uh, the non Mattel affiliated stuff I'll get to, um, you know, uh, my guy CJ will have me out to his, his super con. If it doesn't uh, conflict with a, a big tournament at this point, which seems to be every weekend. So uh, um, in a couple of years, <laughs> I ran a Cornell tournament at uh, Supercon before COVID. Um, oh, wow. Lectors played cool. and the winners received like some special cars they entered. <laughs> and, like the winner got a, a very a special variation that they had done, which was pretty neat. Oh, sweet. Oh, sweet. OK, that's awesome. And uh, for listeners, you can find me on every platform, uh, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, under JC Squared, J-A-Y-C-E-E Squared. And if you're listening to this podcast on Apple or Spotify, please give it a five-star review. It helps. And uh, if you're not and you want to listen on YouTube, you can do that as well. Uh, Subscribe to the YouTube channel. And just a special thanks to my members, Lucas, Gabriel, the Lima Gonzalez, I think I'm saying that right, uh, Road of the Dragon Lord, Citrus 3, Al Morn, Ratchet RPG 01, and Al Seg. Thank you so much. And thank you, Eric, for coming on. It was a real blast to have you. It was awesome. It's awesome to help you out, man. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, with that, anything else you'd like to add? <laughs> I mean, I would say throw them straight, and I would say uh, keep it rolling. <laughs> throw them straight and keep it rolling. All right. Thank you. Peace, guys. This has been the Squared Corner Podcast. Music composed by Steve Rocket. Video and audio recording by Riverside.fm. Video and audio editing by JC Square. Logo art by Miguel Martinez. And lastly, supported by you, the viewer. Thank you. <laughs>